Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nicoletta Pieredu. I'm the inaugural director of the Georgetown Humanities Initiative. And uh, on behalf of all my colleagues, I wish to welcome you to the art and craft of podcasts, teaching, learning, researching. This is the second event of our Humanities in Action series, aiming to promote on-campus conversations about different forms of engagement and outreach for humanities pedagogy and scholarship, trying to go beyond the classroom and the classic single-authored monograph. We had a first panel on academics and public writing in September, and another one is coming up on November 17th, devoted to digital humanities. The updated list of topics and participants is being finalized and I will circulate it very soon. So I hope you can join us also in November. So podcasting, uh, 15 years after Apple first offered over 3000 free podcasts on iTunes, the medium has, we can say, become mainstream. According to Edison research, there are now 62 million Americans listening to podcasts every week. And apparently they have the embarrassment of choice. Over 800,000 active podcasts with over 54 million podcast episodes are currently available worldwide. Big media, but also leading content providers have entered the podcast industry. Even Barack and Michelle Obama agreed to make a series of podcasts on Spotify because, as the former president said, quote, podcasts offer an extraordinary opportunity to foster productive dialogue, make people smile and make people think, and hopefully bring us all a little closer together. Given the popularity of this medium, tonight we wish to explore some of the ways in which podcasting is being used on campus to support and enrich teaching, learning, and research in higher education and to promote forms of student faculty collaborations that blend scholarship and pedagogy. The following members of the Georgetown community will share their experiences with us tonight from different areas uh, of the humanities. Sarah McNamer, Professor of English and Medieval Studies and Director of the Global Medieval Studies Program. Her core area of expertise is Middle English literature, but she has also published in Italian medieval literature and the history of emotion. She teaches courses ranging from Chaucer to English literary history to critical approaches to world literature. And at present, she's teaching an Ignatius seminar called Pre-Modern Worlds, A History Through Literature and the Arts. And her experience with podcasts derives precisely from this seminar. Tonight, she will focus in particular on making podcasts about medieval Africa. Ishan Rai, a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service, planning to major in international politics. In his freshman year, he was part of Professor Sarah McNamer's Ignatius Seminar, where the class crafted a podcast on a museum artifact as part of their final project. Outside of class, Ishan contributes to the Hoya and Caravel newspapers. Emma Mosquire, a second year PhD student in the Department of History. Her research focuses on the connection between climate change, agricultural practice, and scientific and cultural understandings of the natural world in pre-industrial Northern Britain. She has worked for environmental nonprofits advocating sustainable agriculture and policy. And since 2019, together with her advisor, Professor Dagomar de Groot, she has co-hosted the podcast, Climate History, which will be the, the framework of her reflections tonight on podcasting the past, present and future of climate change. Robin Steelwell, trained as a musicologist, she teaches in the music and film and media studies programs. She works primarily on music in multimedia, dance, theater, film, and television, and is currently working on a book on podcasts, radio, and audiobooks, specifically thinking about how sound conjures space, image, and movement in purely oral media. 
we all look forward to Professor Steele's reflection on shaping time and space through sound. Our moderator is Meg Oakley, Director of Copyright and Scholarly Communication at the Georgetown University Library since 2014. She provides information and guidance to Georgetown faculty, staff, and students on matters relating to copyright and scholarly publishing. Meg is also chair of the Scholarly Communication Committee. Prior to her position, she was head of reference and associate law librarian for public services at the Georgetown Law Library. She was also adjunct professor at Georgetown Law, teaching advanced legal research classes. And prior to that, she was a reference librarian and lecturer in law at Duke Law. Our panel is structured as a conversation and encourages also questions from the audience. So please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A feature. We will address them towards the end of our event, approximately the last 15 minutes uh, after our panelist conversation. Thank you very much. I leave the floor to our moderator, Meg Oakley. Thank you. Thank you. But, uh, I'm just delighted to be here this evening with these panelists, and I think the best thing that I can do right now is just get to the panelists and start this conversation. Um, so, Sarah, um, you have been using podcasts as assignments in your global, global medieval studies classes. I was wondering if you could um, explain to us why you decided to use podcasts as an assignment um, and what skills or experiences you'd like the students to develop through a podcast. So thank you. I've used these in the Ignatius seminar context. And first I want to say that institutional structures and initiatives are really important for this. And uh, the Ignatius seminar allows one to sort of wander and experiment in these wonderful ways. So I taught for the first time a course that was centered around objects last year. My primary field is literature, but we focused on objects, had a lot of excursions to area museums, in part because I was inspired by the podcast series, The History of the World in 100 Objects that was um, produced by Neil McGregor of the British Museum and by the BBC. Because in within 20 minutes, you can look at a particular object, hear it described to you and learn so much about the world in a very short uh, space of time. So I wanted to do that with my students um, and I think it has been very successful so far. I'm doing it again this year. I think one of the advantages is that it can be a supplement to the other work that we do in class. I would never want to forego the kind of quiet, reflective experience of writing papers or constructing a really compelling argument. But one of the advantages of working with this medium is first that it doesn't need to be an argument, that there are other ways of learning and conveying information and the podcast format allows for that for um, becoming curious about something, leading your listeners into that experience and uh, conveying something important. I also think that medieval anything, medieval studies, medieval, the medieval world has a PR problem in that so many are um, either um, feel daunted and feel that it's a daunting subject or there are associations with the barbaric or the simple or the primitive and all of these things. So one of the things that we're seeking to do again in a very short podcast is open up these worlds that are so rich and interesting and compelling. So um, the podcast is a really ideal form for that. And I think the last thing I would just say is that the human voice is um, really such an interesting feature of humanity. If we think of the humanities and uh, of human beings as storytelling creatures, um, there's actually a, um, a performer of the medieval epic, the Sunjata, who performs the oral history of his, uh, the Mande peoples um, through the Sunjata. And when asked, well, why don't you have a written form of this epic? He said, why would you ever want that when you could have the warmth of the human voice? Uh, which conveys not only uh, the content, but a kind of um, it invites affective engagement and the experience of the senses. So those are some reasons why I've, I've engaged with this project. Great. Thank you, Sarah. 
Um, I'd like to turn next to Ishan, who was a student in Sarah's class and actually created one of these podcasts. And Ishan, I was wondering if you could tell us as a student, um, what was your initial reaction to be uh, being asked to create a podcast instead of a more traditional assignment, particularly in a humanities class, um, which would normally be some kind of paper or reflection? And how did you go about thinking about your uh, podcast and literally how did you go about making it? And do you feel that you got um, sort of a different experience um, working with your topic uh, by doing a podcast instead of a, a traditional assignment? Sure, yeah. So um, uh, yeah, I, I, I would definitely agree with the uh, professor in um, uh, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it acts as a perfect, you know, addition to, you know, other assignments like an essay and such. So just first going on to the, my initial reaction, you know, obviously initially when Professor McNamer, you know, said, okay, you know, our final, our final assignment for this class is going to be a podcast, you know, I was a little definitely surprised and, you know, maybe a bit it seemed a bit daunting, you know, how were we going to do this? Because, you know, it seemed like a podcast seems like such a complex thing to do. But, you know, when we actually start to get into it, I realized it actually wasn't so bad. You know, we used to actually make it, we used um, GarageBand, which is the, you know, the music app on that comes with like with every uh, MacBook. So, you know, it's it's a music app, but it turned out it worked perfectly for, you know, just a straight podcast as well. So I think, you know, as a professor touched on, you know, it really allows you to access certain skills that, you know, you wouldn't be able to uh, engage with just with a normal paper. You know, the aspect of, you know, the human voice, right? We had to spend a lot of time thinking about sound quality, you know, how were we able to get, how were we able to get our voice sounding well? So we had to get, you know, these, the right microphones from the library and you know, the lounger is very helpful in that. And also mixing uh, music as well was a big part of it. So we had to figure out, you know, how to, you know, mixing music in the background um, to sort of, you know, augment and sort of uh, 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 catch the listener, so to speak. And, you know, mixing it, making sure it didn't overpower the, uh, your voice, making sure to make sure it wasn't copyrighted music. So I think all these aspects, I think, as the professor said, it acts as a really nice complement to an essay and just it's a really unique way of engaging with the material, you know, specifically a uh, historical object. I did um, a, it was basically an ivory hunting horn from Sierra Leone is in the African Museum, the Smithsonian in DC. So that, you know, that was the uh, object I engaged with and I think it was a really informative way to do it as opposed to just a normal essay. Great, thanks for sharing your experiences with us. I'd like to turn next to Emma, who's been working on um, the um, Climate History podcast and has co-hosted eight recent episodes of that. So Emma, you're using the podcast as a way to communicate some um, very important scientific and interdisciplinary information on climate change. And I was wondering if you could um, explain to us how you work with your guests who are experts in a range of subjects that are um, you know, unknown to most of us from paleoclimatology to law uh, so that they be able to communicate their research in a way that's understandable and engaging um, for a public audience. And um, if you could also maybe describe a little bit why you choose a podcast um, to do that as opposed to some of the other media that are available. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's convenient, you know, starting out speaking with experts in other fields um, because I can genuinely ask a lot of questions to which I don't know the answer about um, the, the paleo sciences and climate change or law and climate change because those aren't my areas of expertise. So questions, um, you know, when they're coming in an interdisciplinary or a multidisciplinary conversation really come from a place of genuine curiosity. And our guests um, who come from, you know, a range of um, 
of fields can share their expertise with us and um, we're listening to them, you know, for the first time as well as our listeners. So we can really start from the ground up in the conversations that we have with them um, and ask them to tell a story about their research and how their research um, can help us know more about the past um, and by extension, the, the present and the future of climate change. So um, I think to, to get to the second part of your question um, as well, there's a real benefit in the podcast medium because it really removes a lot of the barriers that um, are in place for getting a lot of this information to open up a scientific journal um, or a law journal or to you know attend a conference um, isn't something that's accessible to everyone, especially if they're not accessible, um, you know, involved in that particular field. Um, so the podcast medium allows um, for those barriers to be taken away um, and we get more of the, the same conversation. So we typically structure our interviews by asking about the, the nature of the research that our guest does, whether that's tree ring research or social science research that involves interviews and ethnography. Um, and you know, from there, um, we can get into some examples of their work, um, which generally leads to really compelling stories, not only about their findings, but also about the process of, you know, the travel, the field work that goes into um, their research. Um, and we, we do typically finish up our interviews by asking, what does this mean for the future? What does your research about the past um, tell us about where we might be headed or what actions we might be able to take. Um, so there's a real bringing that research, which might be kind of esoteric, um, you know, if encountered in, in a more academic setting um, into, um, a, you know, a framework that's more accessible for someone who doesn't necessarily have um, a background. So my hope is that someone can begin an episode um, about dendrochronology, the study of tree rings, or, um, you know, the study of a particular history, um, not knowing much about the topic, and by the end have learned something about not only the past of climate change, but how we know what we know and what we can do with that knowledge going forward. Thank you. It's a really a fascinating um, subject area to be able to translate that into um, this content that's accessible to the, the public. I find it very engaging. Um, so the next question is for um, Robin. And um, I know you've used podcasts um, in teaching, but I'd like to ask you um, to comment on another way that you've studied podcasts about analyzing the podcast from a scholarly perspective with addition, particular attention to the role of, of music and sound in the podcast. I was wondering if you could describe that a little more and also um, tell us a little bit about how some of the information um, and research I've too conducted might be able to help um, somebody who's more of an entry level podcaster without high end equipment and technical support put together a more compelling podcast by using sound and music effectively. Yeah. Well, I just want to echo something that Ishan said earlier, which is that getting the balance right is, is actually really tricky. It's easier. <laughs> it sounds easier than it actually is. And it can depend on, there are a number of different elements to it. I have also done video essays, which are closely related to podcasts, but have a visual element. And I found that I can get away with kind of, I hesitate to use the word sloppy, but less precise um, oral content if I've got visuals. If I don't, I have to be much more careful. For instance, I will talk over music if I've got a visual. I will not do that if it's oral only. Um, it makes a huge difference. Um, now, you said low end or high end. These days, things like GarageBand, Audacity, 
Um, there are a number of programs that you can use that are very, very simple, but actually as powerful as what, you know, you used to have to go into a recording studio to access not even that long ago. So you can get a really nice sounding podcast without, without a whole lot of outlay. If you've got like a, a Mac, a MacBook Pro like I'm on right now and, um, and a decent microphone. Although you never know, I was using a fancy microphone and for some reason I couldn't get the volume high enough to talk over some things that I wanted to talk over. And I didn't actually wanna take the sound down more because then you start to introduce distortion into the music. So I needed to get over that. And I realized, I found out kind of by accident that all I had to do was unplug my fancy microphone and use the, the computer and just talk to the computer. So, you know, playing around with that can, can be very effective. There are just some things that we know from the interaction of music and other things that are always useful. Very simple music and sound can have a tremendous effect. Um, just the introduction of a drone creates a forward, what Michelle Shion calls a forward vector. It's like, we know we're going somewhere and we can tell that there's a direction, but we don't really know what that is. You add a rhythm to that and then you've got a sense of how fast you're going. Um, so there's some really simple musical profiles that can be used to shape things. Um, if you wanna slow something down, make the music fast. If you wanna speed it up, make the music slow. There are these kind of counterintuitive things. Um, but again, this idea that I can't remember if it was Sarah or Ishan brought up is that you're not giving information in the same way that you would be in a paper, right? You, you have a great deal of, you, you can create a lot of density in a paper. Goodness knows I've been created, <laughs> I have been criticized for the density of some of the things I've written. Um, and doing it orally actually makes you step back. And there's this kind of intermediate step that we had this like the conference paper. And if you've ever given a conference paper and listened to it, a friend of mine calls it the trailer, that the conference paper is just the trailer for the movie, which is the real article. Um, but the trailer is what draws you in, right? It's what gets you there. And I feel like a podcast is almost like the trailer for the trailer or or it's the deleted scenes or something. It's, it's something extra. It's not necessarily giving you as much density or even as much depth, but it gives you an essence. It can give you a feeling um, over things. Uh, I do not assign podcasts for students, but I make it a possibility. And I've noticed that over the past three or four years, I've taught classes that focus on musicals so that there are performance aspects to it. And students often pick that as a choice for performance because they can articulate ideas about performance, which are really, really hard to talk about. Uh, and so there are certain things that we do as humans, speaking of the human voice, that we all know when we hear it, but we don't know how to talk about it. And musicians are even bad about talking about it because we don't talk about it. Um, but by using an oral medium, you can articulate that. So we've been talking about objects, but what is the musical object? Is it, a, is it the sheet music? Is it a performance? Is it a record? Um, I mean, this, is, this has actually been quite a debate over the past 50 years. Um, so there are ways in which sound can let us into that. And then at the other end of the spectrum, I'm um, working as a researcher, looking at podcasts which are sonically rich. Radio Lab, for instance, is probably the one that people are used to, S-Town. Um, but I'm also going back and looking at radio and listening to Edward R. Murrow's broadcasts from the London Blitz. And the way that he makes the combination of the sound that is there that is live sound because they weren't allowed not to use live sound. It had to be live sound. But the way that he could articulate things that creates a sonic event out of his voice and how that works. Or Orson Welles radio program, The Shadow, where he has to, 
it's a radio program and he has to evoke invisibility. I mean, think about that. That's a lot of richness. And so I was already doing that. And then last summer, last September, um, a very famous guitarist and songwriter, well, famous is maybe not the right word, influential, let's put it that way, uh, named Robbie Robertson, who wrote like The Wait and The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down and all of these sort of classic songs. He's moved into film music and he, he did this song on his most recent album um, where he sings about the experience of listening to the shadow and listening to him be invisible and the effect on that of, of him as a child. And so the layers of kind of sonic experience in that, I think are really, I mean, I think that's really pushing the borders of what you can do, but you can do that. It, it would not be as interesting to make a little movie of that, but to make the oral experience. And so from creating the oral experience to evoking the oral experience to just talking in a way that imparts information in a different way than writing could. I think oral media has a lot more to offer. And we kind of did, you know, jump from radio to television and film and kind of not pay attention to radio at all. And it's kind of like now that podcasts are popular, people are starting to go back and look at radio. And I absolutely believe that's the main reason why radio studies suddenly started to kick up in the late aughts. Because I'd always wondered why aren't people talking about it? I'm like, because they didn't have a context for it. And now we do. Great. Thank you so much. Um, do any of our panelists have any comments or questions for the other panelists, but based on these um, opening remarks? Well, I'd like to just, um, before we go deeper into some of those issues, um, just talk about podcasts as a research tool as researching was one of the, um, the topics in the, the um, title of this, the art and craft of podcasts, teaching, learning and researching. So we talked a little bit about teaching and learning as well as actually the um, logistics of creating the podcast. Um, but in terms of using podcasts as a research tool, um, most of the conversation that we've had so far has been about podcasts as a communication tool um, either in the classroom or directly um, to the public. So are podcasts an effective research tool for you? And in what ways might um, students or scholars use podcasts to further their research? Or would it be more appropriate to think of this as a way to communicate uh, with various communities? Um, I, I have one response to that, which is that for my students, I have required them to interview an expert as part of their research. So the research process has really been um, interesting, I think, for these podcasts. First, because uh, of our wonderful librarians at Lowinger, um, Melissa Jones and Sandra Hussey and Meg, um, being able to advise students on how to think about copyright and permissions and how to find a peer reviewed source for this or for that. So the librarians who have helped with us uh, with the research project have been really wonderful for this. But also I, I have asked students to interview an expert in the field. And that's another form of research that I want them to encounter to be very curious about something, meet someone who knows so much about it and have that really direct communication with that person. Um, so at least that's my, my hope is that that will be really a very energizing and inspiring thing for my students. Um, and it also adds texture to the podcast. So we're trying to think a little bit more about the, the audio texture, but also intellectual texture. So. Uh, mostly, it, these are kept on the level of uh, very clear communication, but it's okay and good to sort of move into a different mode where the language is in, you know, it does include terms of art and particular technical terms and really reveals the expertise that especially the, the um, professors and curators that my students have interviewed are bringing to the table here. 
Um, so uh, we're looking for that, but I think that direct um, experience of interviewing an expert, I think as Emma was saying, that's such an essential part of many podcasts. Um, and that is, um, I think, a really exciting ex part of the experience of doing research. Thank you. Um, Ishan, as a student, how did you feel about doing primary research yourself with an expert? Uh, maybe you could tell us who you interviewed for your podcast um, and how did that compare to, you know, doing research um, in the library and databases or print materials? Yeah, so I think, yeah, I, I, I would definitely agree with Professor McNamara. I think the interview opportunity was, you know, that's, that is such a central part of, you know, modern podcasts. And I think engaging with that was definitely, you know, it was, it was a, it was a cool idea. And uh, so for mine, I interviewed um, uh, Catherine De Luna. So she's a professor of uh, African history, I believe. So basically, so the whole, so I think as Professor McNamer mentioned earlier, you know, oh, a big part of our project was, so we focus on medieval times, medieval artifacts was sort of bringing the medieval ages, you know, to light, because I think we sort of have these maybe, you know, not very clear perceptions of the Middle East or a lot of mis of the medieval ages, sorry, of, uh, and we have a lot of misperceptions, you know, that there as the dark ages, it was sort of isolated. And in particular, mine object being an African object, of course, we have tons of uh, misconceptions about Africa being sort of an isolated and dark continent at the time. And so my object particularly, it was, so it's from West Africa, but it was traded into, it, into Portugal and Spain and it made the rounds in Europe. So when I interviewed uh, Professor De Luna, I basically talked about this idea of, you know, oh, we think of Africa as sort of this area that has been cut off from the modern world for so long. And you know, it's, it's only recently come to light, but I think my object sort of showed the opposite of that. And uh, Professor De Luna sort of talked about, oh, that idea of Africa as dark was sort of brought in as a you know co colonial idea to justify imperialism and such. So I think uh, you know having that professor interview sort of uh, allowed me to basically augment the central thesis of my podcast. Let's say so. I think just tying that all up into the research aspect, you know, it really helps augment that. And Emma, you had mentioned um, that you were learning from these experts in various interdisciplinary areas related to climate change. Um, has any of the, um, sort of the, the, the information that you've gotten from the research uh, or from the experts that you've interviewed inform the research or um, of the, the Climate History Project or future pod podcasts, um, or has it more been a communication tool? Yeah, I would say for me, um, the podcast has been a really fantastic tool um, as a very junior scholar to get to chat with people who are leaders in their fields from other universities and from other institutions whom I might not otherwise have the opportunity to meet and speak with um, is just um, such a privilege for me as someone who, who interviews and gets to chat with these folks. Um, and when Dagmar um, de Groot began the podcast, he was also um, still in graduate school when he founded it. So um, the podcast functions uniquely, I think, as a tool for junior scholars to do things and, and make connections that might be more difficult um, without the podcast format. Um, so I'm looking forward to this forming, you know, the basis for potentially future research collaborations um, and certainly ideas for my own research. Um, you know, I'm so fortunate to be here at Georgetown learning from so many multidisciplinary experts in in the fields I'm interested in, but to have, um, you know, the opportunity to to gain inspiration and insight into the work that I'm doing from these other people as well um, is really helpful. So I think, yeah, um, there is 
the sort of first and foremost thing that we think about podcasts is definitely as a communication tool and especially one that is um, accessible to a general audience. But I think um, something that doesn't get discussed as much, and I'm glad that we're talking about it now, is the fact that communication between scholars is so important, especially across disciplines. And for a podcast to facilitate that, I think raises really exciting new research questions, especially in a dynamic multidisciplinary field um, like climate history. Thank you. Um, so if building on that a little bit, I'm wondering if um, any of you would be able to comment on the the possibility that maybe podcasts would allow us to um, maybe form some new or different communities around scholarly interests, particularly in the humanities, um, by allowing new voices and more diverse voices into the conversation. Um, traditionally, the barrier to entry into the humanities um, communities is pretty high in terms of um, the journals and the um, books that you know have to go through um, uh, you know, editors and peer reviews and everything that it takes a long time and there's um, obviously uh, more people who want to be in those conversations than are allowed in by the current system. So is there um, I just if you could just uh, talk a little bit maybe about your own experiences with this or how in the future we might be able to have, different conversations in different communities than the current scholarly communication system is set up for. So I have a perspective on that, which is that um, we in medieval studies moved to global medieval studies a few years ago, and that has been um, really a way to build community across our campus. And we've seen that happening in lots of ways. But I see the podcasts as furthering that effort to go beyond uh, Europe when thinking about medieval period. So we've created this um, website through the help, help with the help of the library at Georgetown Domains website where we have the pod podcast from last year, including Ishan's um, available there. But I've um, imagine that as something that could be expanded in many ways. So it's just called pre-modern worlds and it could, could be um, podcasts that are offered by anyone, not only my students for this class, but for others, um, for other students, for other faculty from Georgetown and from the wider area. So I see that as a way to invite more voices in and to really spark interest because I, again, I think when students can listen to something for 10 minutes, 12 minutes and recognize, oh, that's such an interesting field of study and that professor teaches here at Georgetown and, and so on. I think that can really be part of this, um, you know, work of engagement and outreach that you, you mentioned earlier, Nicoletta, that it's a really good form for that. I'm just reminded here, I'm seeing in the Q&A, um, Howard Spendelo was one of the professors that one of my students interviewed last year. And I'm glad to know that that was a positive experience for the professors as well as the students. That, so even that kind of dimension of community building with professors being asked to give an interview as an expert, I think is, um, I think it could, can be a good one. It's Robin. Yeah, I was just going to pick up on that as we started about talking about this as, you know, reaching across, reaching across disciplines, right, reaching to people in far flung places. But especially right now, I think we shouldn't underestimate the ability to reach across to the person in the desk next to you. Um, I've been using a lot more peer review in the last couple of years among my students and also making something like a podcast an option and more and more people are picking it up and I'm hoping that that almost the, it's almost priming you to talk right because people are are used to writing and they they can't talk about things as well but the podcast actually makes you talk and makes you learn how to articulate these ideas that you have in a relatively concise way and also figure out strategies of how can I get X amount of information out 
in a specific amount of time. And we are taught strategies to do that with um, writing. And that's one of the reasons writing ends up so dense uh, or it can. But the impulse is kind of the opposite when you're doing something oral and linear. And I mean, oral, oral and linear in terms of the podcast. And so I feel like it can also be really useful as teacher to student. Um, I've mentored a student who is doing a podcast in China. Um, and, you know, what are the strategies to setting up an interview, et cetera. Um, so I think while it's, it's tempting at first to think really large, and I think that's really exciting, I think we shouldn't neglect the idea of keeping it local as well. Uh, it's just, I mean, the difference between radio and podcasting is time shifting, right? So it's a way of time shifting a conversation in some ways, or it could be. Thank you. Yeah, I know when I was doing some um, research a couple of years ago on a podcasting program that we had done through the Scholarly Communication Committee, I found that the information on radio, particularly from NPR, was so directly applicable to um, to podcasting. And we actually had a, a speaker from NPR come um, as one of our panelists, and the the connection there is 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 great. Um, so there's a lot of information out there from NPR and other. Um, sources on how to do radio and it's it feeds right into the podcast. Um, so Ishan, you had talked about um, your podcast being relating to an object and Robin earlier you had talked about um, video, sorry I'm forgetting the word videos. Um, video essay? Video essay, thank you. Was going with video story, but I knew that wasn't right. Um, I was wondering if anybody would care to comment on the relationship um, between you know objects in visual materials and the podcast. How how you see those two things um, working together? Yes, Robin. I was just suddenly struck by this idea of the object, and there was this TV show that I occasionally put on in the background. Was called mysteries at the museum and they would always start with an object and it would be tell some little historical oddity or something and they would start to describe the object before they would show it and so you would get things like it's six inches long and it's got you know it's got this metal thing attached to it or whatever and it would draw you in and you're like what are they describing and then when you would see it you would go oh but in the meantime it had generated all of this imagination of what could that possibly be at the beginning? And so I think that the idea of, of having an image that is being described and the way in which you describe it, I go back to Murrow and the, the Blitz things. That's not an object, but it's a space. And the way that he manages with very few words to actually place himself, you can actually see the place he's at not just in a kind of two-dimensional map like but you can see like the searchlights and you can see the planes and you can you've got this really strong perspectivized Im image in your head from the way he's describing where he's at and what he can see um and yeah we talk about that in literary events but it seems so much more potent when you're actually hearing it unfold in time so I think that the act of describing things that you think, well, just slap up a picture. Sometimes that's not the best way to get, uh, to go back to the shadow. What's fascinating about the shadow would be a boring TV show. It's the imagination of him as invisible that's more potent than actually seeing it. I think I would just add to that, that um, my students, and Ishan's podcast is especially good at this, I think, uh, they were asked to describe the object, but to do so in engaging terms. So to come back again to that word, Nicoletta, of engagement. Um, so to use a shared pronoun. So let's go closer to this object. We can, here we are in the Museum of African Art. Um, it looks pretty simple from a distance, but let's go closer, you know, that kind of thing. And then um, a kind of curious and appreciative language that can involve the audience, not only 
to in visualizing something, but doing that with an appreciation for its affective impact on the viewer. So again, Ishans is really good at this, I think, with, you know, this is mesmerizing, this is um, striking, stunning, you know, to, to use those kinds of adjectives, again, is, I think, really helpful in getting, engaging an audience. Um, and it's also something you can't really do in a paper, you know, an academic critical essay. Usually that kind of affective language is set aside, but here it's very appropriate and it engages the listener and it lets them share that experience of encountering the, the object. So that's one of the great advantages, I think, of the medium. And I guess to just add to that, there have been studies about how literary texts create images in our minds through descriptive language. So for the students to learn how to do that, how to produce images in the minds of their um, listeners, you know, is I think a really, it, it's mimicking a lot of what literary texts do. So I think that's another, um, you know, benefit to using this medium. Can I just briefly add, we've talked a lot about seeing and hearing, but the podcast also allows us to talk about feel, sensation. What does this feel like? What does it smell like? Even possibly, what does it taste like? You know, so in other words, it, 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 there's something about the medium, I think, that's a little bit more relaxed and allows us to talk about things like that, that would be considered a little bit extraneous in the traditions of scholarly writing that we have, even though I would argue they're still really important, but they're often kind of discouraged. Thank you. Um, we have some time for questions from the audience. If anybody would like to submit a question through the Q&A, please go ahead and do that. We have one right now. Um, and maybe Ishan, you'd be the right person to answer this question uh, first, at least. I'm wondering how much instruction professors give to students regarding podcasts. Do you expect them to learn GarageBand on their own? Can you let us know how you actually went ahead and created your podcast. You talked about it a little bit, but um, maybe where you got help and how, um, what kind of support you got from uh, Professor McNamara and the library and how much you did on your own. Sure, yeah. So we, we definitely got a good amount of help when crafting the podcast, particularly from uh, uh, the library. And um, so during, you know, a few, times in our class we would go to the library and the specifically the people at a, the Gillardin, Gillardin Media Center I believe um, they would basically you know talk to us about you know things like um, sound and obviously I was talking about you know researching uh, books and such but you know all of us we were basically able to make an appointment with one of the Gillardin people and basically they were able to walk us through um, you know, how to use GarageBand, you know, how to turn it to the record rather than just the music functions that play the in electronic instruments, it would play the, um, you know, how to switch it to the recording function and, and how to hook up certain microphones to your computer. So yeah, we definitely got a lot of guidance in that respect, particularly from uh, the library during class. Yeah, and I would just add to that, that um, I was so relieved to learn about all of the help support, you know, provided by the library. So um, I thought it would be out of the question for me to teach a class and assign podcasts as the main um, goal of either the research um, project. Uh, because I'm not good with technology. And so I, but I found very quickly that, um, you know, once again, the library is there to help. And uh, Jill Arden was wonderful um, about suggesting things like, uh, so I had a, a meeting with one of the members of the Jill Arden staff who said, yes, you need to put interim guidelines here, have them do a trial audio by a certain date, then add this. So you break it down and then it can be completed over the course of the semester. So that was really helpful to me that I essentially was able to outsource the technical part um, because I don't have that expertise. 
But I had used GarageBand myself and for other sort of recordings of um, having to do with my work. So I'd had some familiarity with, with GarageBand, but I wasn't doing a hands-on sort of guiding of the students. And this semester too, my student course assistant is, um, is really working with the technical aspects of that. So um, that's, that's how I've handled that. Um, Emma, can you let us know how you create your podcast, which is not um, in a classroom, um, but it is here at, at Georgetown, what resources you're using and how you learned that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I actually also had a, a podcast as an assignment during um, my own time in undergrad, um, which kind of primed me to um, begin working on climate history when I arrived at Georgetown in 2019. Um, so I, I'm really grateful that I was able to have that opportunity, which um, had familiarized me with audio editing with GarageBand. Um, we, in, you know, in the before times would um, actually have people come to campus frequently and, and we would, we would sit around one microphone or, um, you know, and just, and just chat um, and that microphone, you know, inputs right into a laptop and then um, you just go in and fix up the audio afterwards. Um, now I think the podcast has opened up some, you know, the, the pandemic has opened up some exciting opportunities that, um, you know, you can chat with so many people via zoom. They don't have to be in your office in Washington, DC. Um, but it also means that I don't have audio recording equipment where I am right now. So the audio quality of our podcast has, I would say, decreased a little bit in the past six months um, because now um, the, the, I don't have a microphone available to me. So um, it's a pretty straightforward setup um, just to echo what's already been said that podcasting is so accessible to so many people now, um, but that's how the mechanics work for us, um, you know, before and after uh, March 13th or thereabouts. Great, thanks. Um, we have a couple of other questions from the audience here. Um, this is for our faculty members. Uh, how do pod podcasts play into the traditional scholarly metrics of productivity, such as publications and service? Robin, would you like to? I, I think that we're not quite there yet. Um, I know that it probably wouldn't count as it probably more be more at this point would be like in our little um, merit review grid would probably come more into something like service to the community. Um, but I think that I think that it's going to change. Um, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm actually studying the objects. Uh, because I'm fascinated by them as objects, but I started out, well, just as a listener. And then as I, I had an emergency in my family 10 years ago and had to go home to Texas. And it was like, how am I going to teach? And recording my lectures was the way that was kind of my entree in. Um, so I think it's right now, it's a little bit in a gray area. Um, but I'm also in a department of performing arts. And so I would argue that it should, I think it should change, but I think it also depends on what is the purpose of the podcast, because I think that they do have, I make tons of video essays and podcasts just to teach from. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily, I, I would do them differently were I to put them out as, as some sort of presentation but I think that's on the horizon I just did you know in film and media we we always have this problem of presentation and so you do online journals that have video like how much longer is it going to be before you know it is a thing it is a video essay instead of just a paper with clips right so I think we're in a kind of gray area at the moment from my experience well, that's a pretty hopeful answer. Thank you, Robin. Um, we have two more questions. I think we have time to get to both of them. Um, are there classes like Professor McNamara's Ignatius Seminar that delve into podcast creation that are open to students in their later years at Georgetown? 
Um, well, I would just say that this experience has inspired me to um, create the podcast as an option for other classes I will be teaching. So, for example, this coming spring, I'm teaching a, uh, a class that's a world literature class, and I will be offering podcasts as an option there. So, and that's a, um, that's for upper uh, class students. Um, so, that is uh, one answer, but I do think that there are more professors doing podcasts than we know about. Um, so that might be worth just when you're reading course descriptions to see if the word comes up, because I think um, more of my colleagues are, are using them. Thank you. And um, I can I'll put the link into the chat in just a moment, but in the library's showcase where we showcase um, works by students across all media that have used resources from the library. Um, there is a whole section on podcasts, which I'll put in there and that will give you an idea of some other classes that have used podcasting as, as an assignment option. So our, our last question here is, I'm also curious as to why if the subject of a piece of, if the subject is a piece of art, you would choose a podcast as opposed to having them create a video. Oh, go, go ahead, Robin. I was just gonna say, I, I kind of don't make a distinction in my mind between video essay and podcast. It's, it's like, what, what, what do I need to get across? And I do, I do both of them and students do both of them. But I would also go back to that that idea of there's something about having that image removed that allows you to think of it. Now, I, I think you obviously at some point you, you engage with the visual image of a piece of art or a piece of sculpture or something like that uh, in, in particular. But there is something about starting to talk about it before or even after that engagement where that's removed. We do that with music all the time. And I think it's actually really enlightening because we can't <laughs> yell over Beethoven. Um, and I, I think that that's actually really useful. I would add that um, manuscripts provide an interesting um, test case of, of some of these issues in that there are quite a few illuminated, you know, illustrated manuscripts, which come across as very visual, right? There are all these images illustrating the text. And, uh, but it's, it's clear that in a lot of contexts, uh, a deliberate decision was made to leave images out so that the reader could imagine the, the scenes. And there, so there is something about listening to something or reading a text and doing the image making in one's own mind that the a physical image can actually constrain. So that's another potential answer there that there is something to be gained even visually by taking away the visual uh, component um, because of the image making capacities of the mind. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We don't have any more questions in the Q&A. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for their participation, their insights. Um, this has been really interesting, engaging. Um, and I think we've got a lot of ideas uh, to consider for the future for teaching, learning, um, and research here. And Nicoletta, did you want to close the program? Thank you so much. I add my gratefulness to yours, really to all the panelists and the wonderful moderator for this very rich and inspiring conversation, which hopefully has allowed us to appreciate a variety of attitude, perceptions, and reported uses of, of podcasts in our, in our community. I was taking notes throughout the, the conversation. Many interesting things came up. We can say that podcasts are intuitively attractive, but when the moment comes maybe to produce one on our own, uh, the task seems daunting, especially if we don't see ourselves as tech savvy. Hopefully our colleagues' experiences will encourage us to give it a try using also the resources uh, that uh, as we see also from the, uh, from the chat uh, are available uh, at the library. So definitely let's give it a try. Maybe as a, as, a, as a summarizing final thought, we don't want to go so far as uh, to echo Marshall McLuhan's famous uh, claim that the medium is the message, 
but certainly <laughs> the medium, this new medium plays a relevant role. We have seen in, uh, if we want to, to say, in, in, in making the humanities narratives more accessible, even democratizing them, if you want. Uh, podcast technology we have seen can be a valuable method for both students and scholars to construct interdisciplinary knowledge and deliver material in uh, a very interactive, accessible, multi-sensory, we have learned, imaginative fashion, and can provide indeed interesting opportunities uh, to reach a broader uh, audience uh, also beyond our campus. So uh, once again, thank you so much for attending. Please uh, keep following us. Uh, you can also leave uh, messages, comments, suggestions for future programs or invited speakers by using the suggestion box available on the website of the Georgian Humanities Initiative, or you can write us at humanitiesgu at Georgetown edu. So once again, thank you to all of you, both participants and uh, uh, audience, and uh, good night. See you in November, hopefully. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>